I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, Kevin McElkrin. Uh, Kevin is a partner uh, in the firm of Blake, Castles, and Graydon. Uh, Kevin uh, practices extensively uh, in the area of insolvency and is counsel to secured creditors, receivers, and trustees. Uh, Ked is the, Ke Kevin is the assistant head of the business law section responsible for creditors and debtors' rights uh, of the Law Society of Upper Canada and has been a seminar instructor since 1984. Kevin speaks frequently on topics of receivership and today Kevin is going to give us a lesson in advocacy because it is said that good counsel can advocate any position. Kevin is now going to lecture us on uh, a law that does not exist, and uh, that's going to take some doing. Thanks, Aubrey. The uh, I don't know how well well I'll do in the with that build up, but in any event, I want to talk a little bit today about or to try and gear our this talk to a sort of a policy basis or an understanding of what we're. Trying to what would be tried what they were trying to achieve in this uh, amendment, which has now been abandoned, for wage protection. And I thought maybe the easiest way of doing it is to is to look first at the notes for the address of uh, the Honorable Pierre Blay, uh, the minister responsible for the bankruptcy legislation, and the remarks that he made, the notes that of his remarks in the House when he was announcing that they were going to go ahead with the with B Bill C-22 without the wage protection pr provisions of it. And uh, I'll just read it to you because it's interesting. It covers, hits most of the highlights of things I want to talk about today uh, and I guess gives a little bit of the guidance of expect expectations for the future. He said, uh, referring to the committee who had reviewed the bill, he said, but all members of this committee know that one area in particular has sparked controversy in Bill C-22, the Wage Claim Payment Act. Mr. Chairman, no one disputes the importance of this part of the bill. We all agree that after a company has gone bankrupt, a mechanism is needed to enable employees to recover wages and to be reimbursed in certain cases for expenses incurred. Several methods of financing wage claims have been recommended. The bill initially called for a wage claim payment fund to be financed through an employer tax to be collected jointly with unemployment insurance contributions. I would like to thank this committee and several of our colleagues to, in the House for their advice on this proposal. Given the difficult economic circumstances in which the country finds itself, our unwillingness to further burden either the corporate or the personal taxpayer and the need to maintain firm control of expenses, the government will not proceed with the Wage Claim Payment Act. Let me assure you that I remain committed to wage earner protection and this protection must be guided by the principle of prompt and certain payment and prompt and certain payment of wage claims. In the interim, I will propose that we, may take, that we take steps to immediately improve the situation for workers by raising a level of protection for wage earners as preferred creditors. It would, raise, it would rise from $500 to $2,000. But Mr. Chairman, we cannot afford to hold up the progress of this bill while we find a solution to the issue of wage earner protection. I'm asking that this entire issue be part of a three-year review built into the S Bill C-22. And I've heard a number of counterproposals to the employer tax, potential solutions but with wide-reaching implications. These proposals merit careful and thorough consideration of necessity that this will take time. What we need and need now, Mr. Chairman, is legislation that helps businesses survive, and what we need is legislation that helps create and preserve jobs. Now, I took the time to read that section of it because it's interesting. If you go through it, you can find, it tells you an awful lot about what's going on and what the committees were considering and what the choices were that they were facing when the uh, committee was reviewing wage claimant, wage payment Claim Act or Wage Claim Payment Act as part of Bill C-22. The first thing is that, that is, as he says, that their protection is needed. It's clear and I think accepted generally that the protection of wage earners is a key part of any bankruptcy legislation. The uh, protection that's been provided up till now has been a $500 protection by way of a preferred claim in the bankruptcy 
But as anyone who practices in this area or anyone may has any experience with the bankruptcy process knows, it's very unusual that there's any money left over at the stage at that level of priority. Because you have to remember, of course, that the money that's distributed to creditors of preferred status is the money that's available after you've already paid all the secured creditors and after the deemed trust has been paid. It's really, and after the trustee's costs have been paid, by the time you get down to the preferred claims, that the reality is that there isn't anything there. So, and that, as you see in the, in the speech, he talks about changing it from $500 to $2,000 as if that's an interim protection that can mean anything to employees. And obviously, that's not the case. It just means nothing. It's just, uh, uh, I guess, a, a pyrrhic victory for employees if you're looking at it that way, uh, looking at it from the point of view of the employees. But in terms of changing anything, it changes nothing for, of substance. The second point that's made is that they've reviewed, they've reviewed, in, I guess, in creating the legislation and also reviewing it in, in uh, committee, they reviewed a number of different choices of funding recommendations, things that could be done in order to create a fund to, to pay wage payment, wage claims in the context of an insolvency. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll get to in a minute, I'll talk about those choices that there were, were available and the one that was chosen in the Wage Claim Payment Act and, and what, uh, what was good about it, what was bad about it, and maybe might make some comparisons to the Ontario legislation, B, B, B70, which was in, incorporated into our Employment Standards Act recently. The next point he makes, and this is the political comment, is the payroll tax was not acceptable as a mechanism of financing the fund for the fund for employees. And it talks about as well that, that they're not unwilling to burden either the corporate or a personal taxpayer. In other words, that the government is not going to be the source of funding for this fund and they have to find some other way of doing it. The, the comment made is it's not timely to do it now because in this particular environment of in, we're finding ourselves in this recession that more taxation, I guess, and also budgetary restraints arising from the deficit, that it's the wrong time to be adding taxes. So that the payroll tax and any tax is difficult to justify and therefore put off employee protection. Fourth point is that the government is committed, notwithstanding not prepared to fund it, but the government is committed to employee protection and that protection would be guided by promptness and certainty and we'll talk a minute about how the legislation was going to do that. The th next point is that he says in his speech that the bankruptcy amendment uh, will, should not hold up, the, the Wage Claim Payment Act part and the controversy concerning that, the funding of it, shouldn't hold up the bankruptcy amendment process because we're going to have to go through thorough and careful consideration of the options of funding employee protection and that's going to take time so let's get on with bankruptcy amendment. And the last point is that really what comes down to this, we now are looking at review in another three years. What that really means is employee protection is going to wait for another three years and at the end of that time it's likely the recession is going to be over and we probably won't have the problem anymore. Maybe at that stage the political cost the problems about funding will be disappearing as well. So. It's inter interesting, it touches on, in a very short space of time, touches on all the main issues. And what I want to and give some clues about what's wrong or why the, thing, the process failed. Now the paper that I've submitted and it's in the material today is really focused on the choices that were available from the funding side and what it is that we're trying to, would be trying to achieve, the government's trying to achieve in a wage payment protection scheme. There really are, I mean I think it's, it is a generally accepted idea that weight that employees ought to be protected and ought to get preferential treatment over other creditors for a couple of reasons and the primary reason is that the employees are generally considered not to be in a position to protect themselves. That they're unlike a supplier of goods, they're not in a position to insist on COD payment, they're constantly and for their arrears of wages for the week that they're working, they're always a week behind and pay and there's always a risk that there's, if you close the doors on any particular day that employees are going to be out, one, their wages for that week unless somebody comes along and funds it voluntarily or two, they're going to be out and two, they're going to be out their vacation pay which is accruing over the year and will likely be an outstanding amount. 
not only the federal government, but also the provincial governments have tried to address these concerns and protect those kinds of claims. The first claim, that is their earned wage claim, has been protected in Ontario and in, under the federal corporate legislation by director liability. So the directors are liable for those kinds of arrears of wage claims. And that case law has found that not only are the directors liable for their wages, but they're also res responsible for accrued but unpaid vacation pay. Those provisions are in the, the, uh, the corporate legislation and they're also in Bill C-70, there's, I'm sorry, in Bill 70 in the uh, provincial sphere are also incorporated into amendments of the Employment Standards Act in Ontario. Aside from director liability, there, are also the pop there is also an attempt to fund employee protection in some legislation, particularly in Ontario, by deemed trust protection. And what deemed trust protection is intended to do is to give a priority to the, the claim for the employees, which ranks ahead of secured creditors and alleviates. It's a version of the same solution that the, that the $500 preferred claim status in the bankruptcy is intended to do. And under the uh, provincial legislation in Ontario and the Employment Standards Act, there is a deemed trust that's created for, uh, in, for vacation pay, which is effective outside of a bankruptcy context. Inside of, in the context of a bankruptcy, of course, though, there's the the decisions of the Supreme Court in the, in the case of uh, Re Hemf Hemphrey Sampson Belair, which holds that the province is, is not competent to create deemed trust legislation, which will be effective in a bankruptcy context. And if there is a bankruptcy, that those deemed trusts will, it will ultimately be uh, found not to be effective and not protect the, whoever they're intended to protect. In the context of employee wage protection, it means a vacation pay, which is deemed to be held in trust. So that process is not, that um, protection has not been effective, it's created on the provincial level and has not been attempted on the, on the federal level through amendments to the Bankruptcy Act as yet. The, the last wet mechanism that's used and can be used and has been proposed in the Wage Claim Payment Act is a, fund, is a funding arrangement whereby employees would be entitled to benefits would, which would be uh, uh, access through a claim against a fund would be established under legislation and in effect would work a lot like unemployment insurance. The, that was what was proposed in the Wage Claim Payment Act and that the trouble of the concept wasn't the problem. The problem was how do you put, create the fund and how do you uh, put money into it without uh, undermining some political or goring some political ox that has, that needed to, need to be uh, protected. And I think the problem that we've had in the last number of years and as we've gone through this process four or five times in the last 20 years, trying to get wage protection, trying amendments to bankruptcy legislation in other ways, and the, the, the problem that's been addressed every time is the cost, how the, is the cost going to be shared among the poti poti sorry, potential participants in the process. What we've ended up with, uh, what was proposed most recently, which was an employer tax, that is a tax is applied to every employer on a per employee basis to create a fund and to fund the benefits to employees was conceived as, as being, a, we can't allocate effectively so why don't we just put it on a general basis and, and attack every, and, and take everybody's money to fund the process or at least all of the people who are employers. The objections that have been raised about that mechanism funding are basically that the employees, the companies which would never become insolvent. You can imagine there, there are a few out there that might actually be impervious from insolvency. There's governments, so particularly the federal government, which will hopefully will never become insolvent in the sense that it's not going to pay its employees. And charitable institutions, for example, the Hart Fund or whatever, who had employees, would be subject to this tax when they otherwise wouldn't be subject to tax and are exempt from tax in every other way. These objections were really uh, fueled other suggestions and other recommendations which were reversion to one of the other two schemes, which is let's go back to director liability or let's go back to uh, super priority as a mechanism of imposing really a user pay kind of mechanism to the funding. That is that the employee, the fund should be funded or if there is a fund, the employee, if there is no fund, the employee claims should be funded by having a super priority charge ranking ahead of secured creditors and the assets. So 
those were the choices that were faced, and you can see that there, the controversy really is everybody's prepared to accept the fact that employees ought to be protected in an insolvency situation, but nobody's prepared to say, uh, put up their hand and say, I'll pay for it. The difficulty, that's really where we come from is, and where we end up as a result of all that is that you end up with no protection whatsoever for employees other than what's really provided on an ad hoc and, and almost voluntary basis by the, uh, by the banks when they go, to, go through the process of employing hiring receivers to take control of businesses and to try to realize on the assets. Generally speaking, through a kind of an ad hoc and voluntary process, the banks end up uh, paying those claims. Now, I, I think what we, it might be useful in this situation, in this context, since we don't have any bankruptcy amendments that are going to be helpful to, uh, to employees, it might be useful to, for the purpose of this forum to look a little bit at the protection that's available under the Ontario legislation, which is Bill, C, uh, Bill 70. Now, I've included in my material a, a review of some of the features of the uh, fund that was created recently in Ontario by Bill 70. And if you, the use, usually you might look at pages 21 and following of the paper in dealing with the fund concept and how it works in Ontario. Generally speaking, The system adopted in Ontario accepts the idea that fund, a fund is the, is the mechanism that best makes available to employees uh, protection in the insolvency context by making sure that they have, that there's some place that the funds will actually be there to satisfy the claim. That this is an advantage that the fund system has over any other super priority or any other system, for, ex for example, director liability, in that in a director liability context, if the director is insolvent as well as the employer being insolvent, then there's no real recourse at for the employee. If you were to use super priority, again, you're concerned with is are there assets to satisfy the super priority claims? And aside from that, the other issue might be super priority over who? You have to ask that question in each context because you may have creditors with security over part of the assets and not security over all of the assets, and you end up with a question to be answered each time uh, whose assets have priority over the employee claim and whose assets work in the employee claim rank relative to other secured creditors. All those questions are really have to be litigated, which adds to the cost and expense of operating the process and really it adds to the attraction of a fund, fund system which can deal with it not on a basis of litigious process, but on an administrative process similar to the way that our, our employ, uh, unemployment insurance system works. So looking at page 21, we'll see that the, the sorry, I'm going to take you further than that. That's wage, WCPA. I want to look at page 24 where the Bill 70 is outlined. The bill, the bill provides and the amendments provide employees with wide protection for employee claims. Uh, they, include it, they include not only as a protection in the statute for uh, a wage arrears and vacation pay, but also for severance termination pay obligations and also obligations arising out of the various other provisions of the, of the Employment Standards Act, including the payment, pay equity orders uh, which are provided under Section 33 sub 4 and other situations where their severance may arise where an employee, for example, is terminated uh, for refusing to work on Sunday, for example. There's a mechanism whereby under the statute that, that an order could be made requiring a payment of what amounts to termination pay for that such an employee and that would, have this, would be eligible for a claim under the Act. The, the claim could be asserted in a variety of contexts, as they're outlined on page 24 there, quoting from the section of the Act, where the employer, employer is insolvent, the employee has, a, has caused a claim for unpaid wages to be filed with a receiver. That's one instance that you may, it may arise. Uh, the second instance may arise when an employment standards officer makes an order requiring payment on the employer and directors 
or may, maybe as well as on directors. And there's also procedures whereby employment office, standards officer orders can be appealed or reviewed. And either of those situations, uh, the, if, if there is such a review or appeal, that those appeals or reviews have been resolved. In those situations, the employee can make a claim against the fund. The total reco uh, recovery may be available for the employee is $5,000 in total on all claims that may be asserted. Now, the, the, the situation we have in Ontario is a bit of a hybrid of the various choices of funding because the employee, although the employee has access to the fund, the fund ends up being subrogated to the employee's claims against the directors, <coughs> against the company, and I, as well with respect to um, vacation pay to the apparent uh, priority that's created under, under Section 15 of the Employment Standards Act for vacation pay by way of a deemed trust. And so that those, although the fund is initially capitalized by taxpayer money, uh, the money that, that can be refreshed by proceedings against directors and proceedings against the company on a super priori partly on a super priority basis, which may be asserted by the fund itself. Now the problem with that process and the, the hybrid that's been adopted in Ontario is that you have situations as a result of the hybrid process where you lose the simple administrative function of receiving the claim, accepting the claim, paying out of the fund. That ends up being qualified by a need to allow people who may be affected by that process, for example, directors who may end up being liable for the to pay the, for the, the payment that's made out to the employee from the fund, the directors have to be involved in the process in order to be able to protect themselves from liability. So what you end up with, what the, the principal advantage of the fund being a nice and simple administrative process to provide employees with protection, ends up being complicated by involvement of others who may be responsible to, on a segregated basis to the fund if the employee receives the benefit. Okay, those are, that's the basic outline of the, of the Ontario provisions. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have wage protection and the, at the federal level because obviously the, there are some problems that arise from the problems that we're experiencing in the, any insolvency situation are partly the difference in the incompatibility of the federal and the provincial level of protection for various kinds of claimants. And it's un unfortunately, there was an opportunity missed in this uh, most recent round of potential bankruptcy amendments that which could have uh, tried to solve some of those problems of coordination at the two levels. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well done. I could imagine how well you'd do if you were talking about something that existed. Um, our last speaker uh, this afternoon is Mr. Frank Hiley. Frank is a partner in the London law firm of Cohn, Hiley, Vogel and Dawson. He practices in the area of corporate, corporate commercial uh, insolvency and has uh, extensive er uh, experience in that area. Uh, he was for many years the senior instructor at the London section of the uh, uh, Barad Creditor and Debtor Rights course uh, and has been a lecturer at the University of uh, Western Ontario Faculty of Law in the area of secured transactions and uh, commercial law. Frank? Take yourself up and away you go. Nice over. Well, good afternoon and thank you for staying. Um, I don't uh, propose to follow uh, directly the material that uh, I prepared and which you have in the handout. <coughs> I'll just, uh, I'd like to make some uh, brief comments about uh, the uh, Bill C-22 as I see it and uh, focus, uh, focus you in on some specific provisions that I think uh, regardless of uh, your level of dealing with the Bankruptcy Act, whether it's a, a statute that you uh, proceed with on a daily basis or whether or not uh, it's one that you just have passing connection with, that you ought to be uh, 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 familiar with. Now, I think by way of uh, general background, I think that uh, I know, for example, that some of my colleagues, uh, John Hansberger and uh, people of, uh, of like mind to John, think that, the, uh, that uh, Bill C-22 is uh, too late and too little and so forth and so on, but my own personal 
view of it is, uh, is that the, these amendments, uh, while in some respect uh, are chopped up and are not, uh, uh, not as uh, broad reaching as, uh, as he would like, uh, I think of better than nothing, and I think that uh, we'd, we'll all be better served by the quick passage of them if that is possible, which it probably isn't. Uh, but I think that the draftsmen of the act have attempted to uh, reflect, of the bill, have attempted to reflect three themes in, uh, in, in these amendments. I think the first one is fairness, uh, and I think that uh, the second one is uh, rehabilitation, and I think the third one is effectiveness. And I think that those themes are reflected in what they've tried to do. In terms of fairness, I think that the, uh, and I'd like to suggest to you that the amendments, uh, uh, for example, with respect to the uh, abolishing or proposed abolishing of uh, Crown Trusts, except for the, the uh, uh, employee uh, uh, deductions, uh, is a good move. The Crown prerogative has been a source of uh, contention for many, many years, as you all know. Uh, I think in that regard, therefore, there's an attempt here to level the playing field somewhat. Uh, and I think that, uh, secondly, in terms of fairness, I think that the uh, inclusion into the Act of those sections which, for example, propose to control the activities of receivers, uh, I think are beneficial for uh, the rest of us who oftentimes find ourselves watching over the shoulder of the receiver, uh, unable to get an accounting uh, from all too many lawyers who don't recognize the common law obligation to deliver it, uh, and hope that, uh, that at the end of the day, there'll be nobody around uh, to ask for it, expect it, and review it. So that I think with those uh, amendments to the Act, they're going to result in, in, in a sort of much more level playing field, and I think uh, a notion of much more fairness uh, in, in, in the Act than has been uh, too far uh, existing. In terms of rehabilitation, my personal view is that the that the division of the proposal uh, sections of the Act, Part 3, into uh, consumer and, uh, and essentially business proposals is, is a smart move. Uh, in London, where I practice, uh, we've attempted to uh, promote consumer proposals for uh, some time. Uh, there seems to be a reluctance on the part of uh, certain creditors to deal with them, one of, uh, not the least of whom is Revenue Canada, who I suspect are going to remain a major thorn in the side of all of us uh, from here on in. I think that the line troops of Revenue Canada have got a bad attitude, and I think that uh, until that is changed, uh, their participation in the proposal process is going to cost us all a lot of money uh, and a lot of time. Uh, however, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the draftsmen uh, have recognized the notion of uh, rehabilitation and its necessity for us. Uh, we've got a shrinking economy. It continues to shrink. I don't know whether you heard the news today, but uh, the senior, senior economist of the Bank of Montreal is predicting that the economy is going to continue to shrink. Uh, and the sooner we get proposals kicked in and get them on their feet and properly utilized as they should be, uh, and as the original drafters of the, of the Act intended uh, them to be, the better, because that's going to be one of the bases for uh, the expansion of the economy. Leaving aside the editorial comment, let's talk for a moment about the technical amendments. Uh, there are technical amendments that are proposed by the bill to be made throughout the Act. Uh, some of the existing sections are, are uh, reworked, are added to. Uh, some of the sections have been repealed, uh, holus bolus, uh, and replaced. Uh, and in addition to uh, that kind of a drafting technique, uh, the necessity for the inclusion into this act of uh, some wholesale reforms has been uh, recognized, and thus you get the new sections uh, at the end of the act dealing with uh, the role of secured creditors and, uh, and what's to be done with those folks. So in terms of, uh, in terms of the specific technical amendments, uh, there are many of them. Uh, looking at the act itself in part two, the interpretation section, the definitions uh, are amended in, in uh, two respects. Two of the definitions there, the definition of court and the definition of proposal, have been changed, uh, and I've set those out for you in the paper. Uh, I don't have to go through them. Uh, in addition, there are three new uh, amendments. Um, the word bank, the words public utility, and the word settlement are now defined. 
Uh, and in terms of those new definitions, I think that uh, the one with the most technical significance is the definition of settlement, uh, which uh, I've set out the definition of settlement at page six uh, of the paper, if you want to have a look at it. I think that, as you know, the Act does never contain the definition of settlement. What a settlement is has been the subject of many cases. And in recent years, the bulk of those uh, cases have been in the area of uh, insurance contracts, uh, and in particular with respect to the designation of beneficiaries uh, and the rolling of previously uh, non-exempt uh, RSPs into uh, uh, RSP vehicles with the life insurance c component, the effect of which was to, of course, and it, the effect of which was to attempt to make uh, those RSPs uh, a judgment proof, non exigible by creditors. Uh, if you look at the cases, and I've given you some of the most recent cases in the paper, the, uh, most of the cases deal with the RRSPs and the life insurance uh, type, uh, type cases, uh, type situations. I think that the definition of settlement for, for you and I has, uh, uh, the, the amendment with respect to settlement has uh, got uh, basically uh, technical significance for three, for three reasons. Uh, the, the definition, uh, if you, uh, the, the definition is set out basically uh, in your bill at uh, page 39, if you want to have a look at it. And I think that that is significant be, uh, for three reasons, as I say. The first one is that uh, the opening words, settlement includes, I think, uh, uh, clearly intend, uh, or a clear statement of intention by the, uh, by the draftsman that the definition is not to be restrictive. Uh, so that uh, what you can squeeze into the definition of a settlement uh, from here on in is a function of what is set out in the, uh, in the, uh, in the definition and what your ingenuity can uh, con concoct. Uh, the second uh, technical, uh, technically interesting thing I think about that definition is the inclusion of the word gift uh, in it. Uh, if uh, those of you who uh, look at the material, have had occasion to look at the material prepared by, uh, by uh, uh, Justice Holden and by uh, uh, Dr. Morowitz in their, in their uh, textbooks on, on bankruptcy and in particular the section dealing with settlements, will know that those two gentlemen uh, make the distinction between uh, a settlement and a gift. And they've, and, they've, and they've said that the distinction basically is the intention of the settle law. So if the intention is to make a gift uh, and the beneficial interest in the property settled passes to the settlee, uh, and that's the intention, no, uh, no settlement uh, within the meaning of the act uh, is uh, capable of being proven. Uh, the inclusion of the word gift, I think, in, in, the, in the settlement definition now probably comes about because of the recent, uh, because of several recent cases uh, out in the West, I think, which epitomize the attitude that the courts are, the courts are taking right now to this notion, uh, which is that basically, notwithstanding the, the various sort of common law definitions, if you like, the word formulae that have been, uh, that have been used in the various cases since 1925 or seven however far you want to go back, uh, the, the use of that word now suggests that if the effect of the transaction is to diminish the estate that's available for uh, distribution to creditors, and, and this transaction occurs otherwise uh, within the criteria uh, set out uh, in section 60, 69, is it? Used to be. Uh, section 91, I think it is now, of the Act, then it will be and notwithstanding any previous notions of a gift being outside of the range of transactions included in settlements, it could now be a settlement uh, and probably will be. I think that that is, uh, I think that that is uh, quite important for us. Um, in addition, uh, from a technical perspective, the, uh, the uh, draftsmen have now included specifically uh, in, in the definition of settlement the designation of a beneficiary in an insurance contract. And that appears in the second or third last uh, line there. All right, leaving aside the definitions and moving on to part five, the administration of estates. 
Uh, those sections of the, of the Act, uh, sections 102 through 115 of the present Act, uh, are dealt with in the bill in sections 100 through 117. And apart from some wording changes and general cleanup uh, language uh, that reflect uh, our society today as opposed to uh, in 1966 or 49, which are the dates of the last major revisions to the Act, there are other certain major changes which I'll just draw your attention to, uh, or significant changes. Uh, in, in Bill Section 101, one creditor now is, uh, enti is uh, one creditor entitled to vote constitutes a quorum for the purposes of the holding of the creditors' meeting. Under Section 103 of the Bill, the subordinated ordinary creditors uh, as those persons are defined in section 137 of the Act, uh, they may now vote at any meeting of creditors. Uh, thirdly, under Bill Section 104, the method of calculation of the votes at meeting of creditors has been radically changed. You will recall that under old section 50, 115 of the Act, there is this sort of convoluted formula for the calculation of votes uh, and uh, that is uh, to be scrapped, and essentially it's going to be uh, one vote for one dollar of proven claim after this, this bill is passed. So it's a straight mathematical calculation. Uh, under bill section 108 now, a trustee may require a secured creditor to file a proof of claim, setting out full particulars of the security that it holds and the value at which the secured creditor assesses that. Now, to that point, that provision parallels the, the existing provision in section 128, which is the valuation section, is one of the valuation sections. The bill, however, in section 108, subsection 1, then provides that if the person served with notice by the uh, uh, trustee to file the uh, proof of security uh, does not do so, within 30 days after the day of the service of the notice to prove by the trustee upon it, the trustee may thereupon with leave of the court sell or dispose of that property uh, that was previously subject to the security free and clear of it. So that in some respects parallels the uh, rights which trustees have enjoyed under section 81 sub 4 of the act. Uh, for some time. In addition to that, requiring uh, where a trustee may require a proof of security, the trustee is given a concomitant right to disallow that security. As you people will well know, the trustee never had the right to disallow, to use those words in the sense that we use them under section 135, never had the right to disallow a secured creditor's uh, uh, proof before. Uh, dealing with the proposed amendment for a moment, trustee can uh, disallow the proof of security. That disallowance is to be final and conclusive unless within 30 days of the disallowance the creditor uh, appeals that disallowance to the court under the general rules. This is the procedure that's very similar, therefore, to the present procedure under Section 135, whereby anyone who's had a proof of claim, any unsecured creditor who's had a proof of claim disallowed, appeals to the registrar under Section 135 uh, in an attempt to get that disallowance set aside. This same procedure is now going to be, uh, assuming the bill is passed, is now going to be uh, the, the situation that the secured creditor will find itself in. Now, I think that's important for, for several reasons. Firstly, it puts a new tool, uh, gives a new tool in, uh, to, the, to the trustee to, uh, uh, to run with. But the, the interesting part about that is that, that the, the way the case law has developed, a trustee who, in the exercise of an administrative uh, responsibility, who disallowed a proof of claim under Section 135, who had that proof of claim a, uh, that disallowance rather appealed to the registrar and who lost before the registrar never paid costs. Those costs 
maybe were awarded, but they're awarded against the estate, and they were never awarded against the trustee personally. Now, heretofore, and prior to, the, prior to the passage of this amendment, when a trustee wanted to attack security, or when he wanted to, if you like, disallow security, he had to, uh, he had to engage in a, either a frontal attack upon it by bringing a motion uh, for a declaration, for example, that it was ineffective, or do it obliquely by bringing a motion under old section 16, new section 34, for, for direction. Uh, in either one of those cases, there were costs, consequences, attendant upon the result. If, for example, the frontal attack was made, the trustee attacked the security, the security was held to be good, uh, the trustee oftentimes would get costs awarded uh, against, for example, against the estate. However, the way the case law is developed, if there are no assets in the estate to cover that situation, those costs would fall upon the trustee personally. I regret to tell you that I am the author of that uh, situation. Uh, I was involved in a case about 10 years ago in which that sort of scenario developed out of an untimely result for a trustee that I was representing. The effect of this uh, amendment is, however, that, that the disallowance of the proof of claim now doesn't become a proactive thing that the trustee chooses to do. I mean, uh, Justice Smith's decision in that case that I was involved in uh, went uh, on the basis that if the trustee chooses to uh, litigate, uh, he does so at his own peril, and if there aren't the uh, assets in the estate to compensate him, uh, or to compensate the estate, or to pay, to pay the, uh, the uh, successful secured creditor's claim for costs in the aftermath of an adverse decision, he's going to pay them personally. Now, with this, uh, with this amendment, the trustee can uh, treat that attack on the secured creditor's position uh, in the same manner as he would treat, for example, the disallowance of a landlord's uh, proof of claim under Section 135 or whatever, and uh, if unsuccessful, there should be no negative cost consequences attendant upon it. I think that's a major plus for a trustee. Um, another amendment, I think, which is of some interest uh, is to uh, the Section 38, as you know, uh, in a situation where a uh, trustee refuses or neglects to act, a creditor can bring a motion uh, before the bankruptcy court and obtain an order permitting the uh, creditor to take such action uh, for and on his own behalf and his own expense and for his own credit if he's successful. A limited form of, uh, of that right formally appeared in addition to section 138 in section 135 subsection 5. That limited right in section 135 is to be expanded by the bill uh, to bring within its purview the right of a creditor to attack a secured, an unsecured creditor's right to attack a secured creditor's proof of security. Firstly, to require it and then to attack it uh, even if the trustee declines to do so. So I think that's an expansion of, of rights of creditors uh, under the Act, and I think that's part of the element of fairness that I spoke about. In terms of the bankrupts uh, moving along a little bit through the Act, in terms of the bankrupts discharge now, uh, Section 169 and thereafter deal with, uh, deal with uh, discharges. Um, Section 169, I beg your pardon, essentially says that the making of a receiving order against or the filing of an assignment by uh, a natural person acts as an application for discharge. Now, that section is left in the Act, but the Act is to be amended by the bill to provide for a new section 168, which is to proceed it. Section 168, in essence, provides for an automatic discharge from bankruptcy for a natural person uh, nine months after the effective date of bankruptcy where firstly that person that bankrupt has never been bankrupt before either in Canada or in any other jurisdiction uh, and in the situation where neither the superintendent the trustee or any creditor opposes the discharge 
So instead of going through the rigmarole now, it's an automatic discharge in nine months after the effective date of bankruptcy. Uh, at that point in time, assuming the, those preconditions I mentioned are satisfied, the trustee simply issues a certificate. He gives it to the, he will issue a certificate. He'll give it to the uh, bankrupt, and that uh, certificate will have the effect of certifying that the bankrupt's discharged from all the debts and liabilities that existed at the date of bankruptcy, uh, subject to the provisions of Section 178. Uh, on the other hand, where the discharge is opposed, uh, then the trustee must firstly file the Section 170 report, and that has to be filed within eight months of the effective date of bankruptcy. If there is to be any opposition by the superintendent, the trustee, or any creditor, that opposition has to be filed prior to the expiration of nine months from the effective date of bankruptcy. And immediately after the filing of the opposition, if any, the, uh, or the expiration of the nine-month period, uh, the trustee must move for an appointment. The Act uses the word forthwith. Uh, and the hearing for the discharge must be held within 30 days after the date set for the appointment. So I think those are amendments which are calculated to move the process along, I think, uh, much more speedily than possibly heretofore it has been. You'll all remember in 1985-86, the backlog of cases in the bankruptcy court in Toronto here was tremendous. Uh, some of the uh, case, average cases were taking uh, two and three years to work their way through the system, and that led to the decentralization of the, of the courts to London and Ottawa. And that's had the salutary effect of speeding things up. And in London, I know, for example, we're, we're running through, our trustees are running through discharges in six, seven months. Uh, longer than that if you don't chase them, but you can get them through in six or seven months. And this is a statutory recognition, I think, of the need for that kind of thing, of the need for rehabilitation, for the need for allowing people to get back on their feet financially. In terms of bankruptcy offenses, uh, section 204 of the Act is, uh, the, is a section which deals with liability of officers and directors where they've acquiesced in or participated in a bankruptcy offense involving a corporation. That section is to be expanded. Its scope is to be expanded now to include, uh, in the words uh, of, the sec of the amendment, any person who has or has had directly or indirectly control in fact of the corporation. Now, just uh, three final matters, if I may. Uh, trustees, act, trustees acting as receivers, interim receivers, and stays of proceedings. You are all aware, I think, that uh, there is a habit in the accounting profession to want to wear two hats. They've managed to do it for a lot of years uh, with some judicial criticism here and there of the role of a receiver becoming a trustee in bankruptcy and then purporting to act uh, in the dual capacity. Uh, there are many, uh, well, many, there are several cogent reasons why that should be permitted, uh, expense efficiency, so forth and so on, uh, in an average case. Uh, and by and large, the concept has found acceptance, uh, notwithstanding the occasional judicial criticism of it. The bill proposes to uh, repeal existing sections 13 and 14, and to replace those sections with sections that, uh, that for the first time, statutorily prescribe uh, the conduct of a trustee. Um, if you look at page 9 of the paper, you'll see uh, set out the, the, uh, the circumstances in which uh, a trustee, certain circumstances uh, by which a trustee is, is governed. Uh, by proposed section 13.4 bracket 1, except with permission of the court, 
No trustee shall act uh, as trustee in relation to the estate of a debtor in the circumstances set out in those sections, in that section. I've set out the circumstances for you in a paper and I won't go through them, but you should note them. Uh, in addition, proposed section 13 bracket 2 also uh, prohibits the trustee from acting in relation to the estate of a debtor where certain other circumstances exist. And I've set those out for you at page 10 uh, of the paper. Now, this notion of a trustee, uh, beg your pardon, a receiver acting as a, as a trustee, uh, typically, for example, you all know that we often, uh, when acting for a secured creditor, uh, utilize a petition in bankruptcy for the purposes of re reversing priorities, typically with a landlord. Uh, section 13.5 bracket 1 of the bill, or at least section 13.5 bracket 1, propo uh, uh, propo is a proposed amendment to the act uh, which, will, uh, which will sanctify, if you like, uh, make good, give recognition to, statutory recognition to, the wearing of both hats by, uh, by uh, the accountants. However, uh, the trustee, in the wording of that, uh, of that proposed amendment, may not act for the secured creditor after the first meeting of creditors uh, to assert any claim against the estate or to deal with the security that the secured creditor holds on the, unless the trustee first, A, obtains uh, an independent written opinion that the security that the secured party wishes uh, to uh, act under is valid and enforceable security as against the estate assets. Uh, and secondly, the trustee notifies the creditors. Firstly, he's act that he's acting for the secured creditor. Secondly, the basis of any remuneration that he's going to get from the secured creditor. And thirdly, provides them with if not a copy of the opinion, at least the content of the opinion. Now, in the event that the trustee does that, the trustee may uh, presumably, given the amendment, then proceed to act for the secured creditor. With respect to uh, interim receivers, uh, you'll all remember the wording of Section 46. Section 46 of the Act is a section that provided for the appointment of an interim receiver. And Section 46.1 said that the court may, if it's shown to be necessary for the protection of the estate of a debtor, at any time after the filing of a petition for a receiving order, and before the receiving order is made, appoint a licensed trustee as interim receiver of the property of the debtor or any part thereof for the purposes set out in the Act. The bill proposes to expand the role and use of interim receivers. Uh, section 46 is to remain. It's not repealed. So you have an interim receiver available in the context of a petition. Uh, in addition, the, the, the bill proposes to introduce the concept of, a, of, a, of an interim receiver in two additional circumstances, both dealing with proposals. Uh, new section 47 one. Now, I've summarized this for you at page uh, 13 of the paper. This, the, 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 first, the first new role for an interim receiver is under section 47 bracket 1, where an interim receiver is available on application after the sending of a notice of intention to realize on security under new section 244 bracket 1 in the context of a proposal. And the second uh, new way it's available is under new section 47 decimal 1 uh, where it's available after the filing of a proposal under section 62 bracket 1 or of the filing of a notice of intention to file a proposal under section proposed section 50.4. So interim receivers then, in summary, are going to be available in the traditional way that they were available in the context of a petition, and they're going to be available to you in the context of a proposal now in the two specific ways that I mentioned. Uh, the final uh, 
The final point I want to touch on is the, the notion of stays of proceedings. Now, as you know, all of Section 69 of the Act provided for a stay of proceedings. And that stay was described in the, well, the section says this, 69.1, on the filing of a proposal made by an insolvent person or upon the bankruptcy of any debtor, no creditor with a claim provable in bankruptcy shall have any remedy, etc. So it was on the filing of a proposal or the making of an assignment, there was a stay of proceedings that kicked in. The bill proposes to expand that situation in three ways. And I've summarized that for you at page 15. There is to be a stay of proceedings in the context now uh, of, a, of a proposal uh, in three ways. And the stay of proceeding will continue to exist in the context of an assignment or presumably a receiving order. So there are four, there are four basic situations now, or under the Act as amended, there will be four basic situations in which a stay of proceedings uh, will be available to the debtor. The first one is section 69.3, uh, bracket one, end of bracket, which is a reflection of old 69, bracket one. That's the bankruptcy situation. And then uh, there will be a stay on the filing of a notice of intention under section 50.4. There will be a, a stay on the filing of a proposal under section 62 bracket 1. And there will be a stay upon the filing of a consumer proposal under section 66 decimal 13 bracket 2. So in those, so the stay of proceedings then will kick in in those four situations which I think are relatively major amendments to the Act. I guess my time has run out and I, those are that, therefore I'll leave it at that and I want to thank you for being here late in the day. Thank you very much for uh, coming out to London to speak to us on these uh, on the subject, um, we have allocated, uh, if you would like, a question period. We have uh, two speakers who have survived the day, uh, as well as myself. If anybody has any questions, if not, uh, I thank you for your kind attention and we'll adjourn. We will, yes. The, the, the question is uh, dealing more or less with transition provisions um, and the effect of the, uh, the passage of the Act on existing bankruptcies. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, you. There are transitional sections throughout the bill. Uh, I didn't isolate them, but uh, there are. And uh, the, some of the sections have been reworded to include wording that, that specifically directs you as to which law is to apply. So they are in the bill. I think some of the earlier speakers pointed out sections where there are no transitional provisions and what you have to watch out for there. Yeah, some are in the Yes. In terms of uh, the uh, section uh, 50.4, notice of intention to file the proposal, uh, I think that in one of the papers I read something to the effect that uh, under those circumstances, the creditor I think the provision is if he can show um, a prejudice, he can get himself removed from the stay. Um, the onus of proof would be on the secured creditor, though, so it's, it's a reverse onus that I can imagine would be very difficult to satisfy. Going once, going twice, gone. Thank you very much for your kind attention.